All right, let's open our Bibles again to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. Hebrews and chapter 13. And today I'm going to read verses 7, 8, and 9. We'll go back and try to make commentary on all those. Hebrews 13, verses 7 to 9. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Remember them which have the rule over you, verse 7. That's plainly a spiritual rule for uh, regarding pastors or elders and bishops who are said to be overseers of the flock, back in Acts 20, verse 28. Notice Paul's wording back in 1 Timothy, you want to run back there? 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17. He says there, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And later here in verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. And also verse 24. Salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints, they have at least salute you, and so forth. Paul says of them at the end of verse 17, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Conversation meaning their outward way of living, as we discussed in verse 5 last time. The things that you can see about them, the things that are publicly known. Because, in the middle of the verse... They have spoken unto you the word of God. Look at the resolution or the resolve of the apostles in the earliest days. Go run, run back, if you will, to Acts chapter 6. Acts 6, to get the setting, and we'll start at verse 1. Acts 6, verses 1 to 4. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians. Now, the Grecians would be Greeks who had converted to Judaism. And now, both them and the natural-born Jews uh, were followers of Jesus Christ. A murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily administration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples, excuse me, unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Who's going to do the mopping? Who's going to do the cooking? Who's going to prepare things? You know, people have been gathering around food for any number of purposes for thousands of years. And it began that way with the earliest believers. And we do it every Sunday here. So if you're watching us by the internet and you want some Korean and some American food mixed together every Sunday, then come see us. Bible Baptist Church International will... We'll uh, have a potluck waiting for you. <laughs> yeah, I like the way they do it down in the Union Rescue Mission. My dad and I went there years ago, and we had, they, first they gave us lunch. And there was a bunch of guys that looked like they were sort of down and outers, and people had just been off the street. And no, no, these were the guys that were, had been cleaned up a while. And after we got done with lunch... They open up these sliding doors into their chapel, and there's 300 guys there that had just come off the sidewalk. And I thought, man, <laughs> I thought these were the bad, the bad dudes. These guys <laughs> really need help. And um, a lot of those places, uh, you had to sit through the sermon and the preaching first before you could get the free meal. The incentive uh, to get a free meal is to sit through the preaching. But this goes on, verse 3, Wherefore, brethren... Look ye out among you seven men of honest report, 
full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may, may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It's, um, let me say, the only way a man can speak unto you the word of God is if he has his own copy of it and has access to it so that he can then study it first before he conveys it to you. I want you to go back to the book of Luke, chapter 1. Luke 1. They say the best way to learn something is to teach it because it forces you to study diligently before you can transmit it to someone else. Luke 1, and the first four verses. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, among us even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto, unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein, wherein thou hast been instructed. Look forward at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Run forward to Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. And verses 12 down through 16. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the, presence, in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The subject of apostolic succession, which is prominent in Catholicism, uh, in the Bible has nothing to do with the popes or the Catholic Church or any other denomination. It is one man passing along correct information to another man, and he to other men, and so forth. It's based on the scripture. It's not based on the whims or the personal opinions of men. Uh, for Peter says, Peter says down here in verses, uh, well, let's read verses 19 and 20 also. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Apostolic succession in the Bible is one Christian passing along the truth of the word of God and the truth of Jesus Christ to someone else, and they to someone else, etc. Um, there are plenty of charlatans, there are plenty of cheats, there are plenty, plenty of robbers, there are plenty of hucksters, there are plenty of phony fakers, and um, as soon as one gets exposed and knocked down several pegs, another one finds, climbs up the rungs to take their place. You think the audience, you think the congregation, the average folks would learn, but they don't. They always buy into it, the next sucker, as a sucker to the next guy who comes along in much the same vein. Um, I'll say this without fear of contradicting or contradiction or error. Oral Roberts was a fake when it came to uh, healing and miracles and so forth. He was a phony. He was a two-bit fraud. And he built this um, 
uh, financial empire named after himself, Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He claimed that he'd laid his hands on two million people over his ministry years uh, and healed them. He didn't heal anybody. I told her the story of his wife's younger brother, whose funeral we had at my day job. And Oral Roberts showed up as a surprise guest, uh, having just had eye surgery for himself, and it was doubtful whether he could attend or not. But his brother-in-law had been stooped over with uh, osteoporosis for decades, and Oral never did anything for him. It was sad to see the man had been in that condition, and his brother-in-law, the world's most famous healing evangelist, couldn't do a thing for him. But uh, run back, if you will, to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. You might keep your finger there in Peter, uh, in First Peter, if you haven't, Second Peter, if you haven't lost it already. But Acts chapter 20, and notice there, verses 28 and 29. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. That means that God has blood. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And back to Second Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, here Peter describes these kinds of people. You can take this description and apply it to uh, the Catholic popes if you want, because they all say what they're doing is in the name of Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 2, verses 1 to 3, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now the long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. But that doesn't apply to some of these TV and internet preachers and some of these phonies and these guys that claim all of these things will be yours as long as you send uh, tuck in your love gift, dear prayer partner and help out this ministry. God will reward you 30, 60, 100 fold, so forth. That's uh, every year TBM to have their, you know, praise-a-thon, they call it. That's to raise money, and they always have these preachers come on who specialize in preaching about financial giving. The more you give, the more God's going to give back to you. Um, it's like they never, they never run out of guys willing to preach that and pitch that in some from some different direction, some different angle. And uh, I thought that was a ministry intended to preach the gospel. The gospel has nothing to do with how much money you give away, or how much money you make, or how much money you hope to receive. It has absolutely nothing to do with your financial status. It has nothing to do with your good deeds or any uh, uh, meritorious uh, humanistic or humanitarian works, I should say, on your part has nothing to do with how kind and noble and selfless and um, thoughtful you've been along the way. has absolutely nothing to do with your merit, your goodness. has everything to do with the work of Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood on your behalf. As the only, only the Savior can save. Your pocketbook can't save. Your checking accounts can't save. Your job and your status and whatever else you claim for yourself can't save. Didn't I mention last week, Philippians chapter 3, Paul runs through this litany of his own testimony, circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of um, a stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and so forth, the Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he says, what things were gained to me, I count but loss that I might, for the excellency of Christ, and I do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Everything I ever attained, everything I ever achieved, Paul says, is a big pile of you know what, and I'll trade it all in for a real knowledge of Jesus Christ. None of those things matter in eternity. My father owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. 
and the universe is going to be mine to inherit one day, and yours as well. But salvation of the soul has absolutely nothing to do with your merit or any reason you might think you deserve it or earned it. And there's five things you can say about spiritual rulers mentioned in this passage. They're to be remembered, according to verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you. Paul also wrote, Know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12. Secondly, they're to be followed, according to verse 7, whose faith follow. He also wrote, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Now, modern versions say, be ye imitators of me. Well, we know that's, that can't be right. An imitation could be a counterfeit. Thirdly, you and I are to consider their end. Verse 7. Paul testified, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. You want to see the end of their ministry. Think of great Christians in the past and how the end of their preaching, how the end of their ministry uh, wrapped up. How did they die? Well, or did they die in disgrace and shame? Did they die with a big blotch on their record and their testimony was um, nullified? Whatever good things they used to be known for have been all rendered null because of some stupid thing they did to tarnish their own reputation and damage the cause of Jesus Christ? I don't want to be like that, and I don't want any preacher to be like that. Fourthly, they are to be obeyed, according to verse 17. Timothy's told, Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. 1 Timothy 5, verse 20. I talked a couple of weeks ago about reproof and rebuke. No preacher really wants to do that. No preacher even attempts to do that because everybody now is so hypersensitive and thin-skinned they couldn't handle you pointing out some blatant error that they are guilty of, some sin they're engaged in, and how it's going to damage the, the uh, understanding, the uh, tenderness of some other Christian who's not grounded in the faith yet. They may be offended by, they, by seeing some other Christian do something that maybe isn't in keeping with the perfect will of God or the will of the Holy Spirit. It's hard to do those things anymore. And yet, a preacher's instructed to do it. And lastly, they're to be saluted or greeted. Verse 24, salute all them that have the rule over you, and so forth. If a preacher is making every effort to fulfill what God expects of him, then he gets extra points. That's about all I can say about that. I'm, you know, you call me Pastor Shrive, and yet Pastor Kim is the pastor of this church. I'm here to help him, and I pray that I'm doing so. Now, when it comes to obeying the word of a pastor, now a pastor, he's told to rebuke them uh, that which sin before all that others may fear. I, I will say this, every pastor, every preacher that would do that better have his facts right. He better have his facts straight before he goes and accuses somebody of something untoward, which might damage other Christians, if he's not certain of the matter. You don't want to falsely accuse someone. Then you're as guilty as, uh, as uh, anyone else for uh, doing something without having all the information. And verse 8, let's move on to verse 8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. That sentence is so plain, it's so simple, it can't be updated, it can't be made clearer by any of the modern versions. A very simple verse. But this verse, along with several others, has caused more people to slip and slide and stumble than a, than a dance floor covered with marbles would do. Imagine that visual. I'll give you a few of them if you want to make a list. Acts 2 Verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, for the, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's been misappropriated and misinterpreted by the charismatics all over the place. It's the basis of a 
Falls Church just up the street from us here, the Jesus Only Group. Here's another text, Matthew 16, verse 18. I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The whole Catholic uh, papacy has been built on that one verse and their private interpretation of it. The Bible says in several places, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. The Catholic Church needs to produce two, or better yet, three verses which would agree that Simon Peter was made the first pope by Jesus Christ. All they have is this one verse, and that one verse doesn't even say it. It's their interpretation that that's what it means, which has become the basis of the entire structure of the popes and the College of Cardinals, etc. Another verse would be John 3, verse 5. Except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he shall not see the kingdom of God. That's used to prove water baptism is necessary for salvation. It's not, but it's used to prove that. A text without its context becomes a pretext. If you find one verse that says something clever, and you ignore all the verses around it, and you can build an entire religious following on that one verse and your uh, assumption as to what it's supposed to mean what it's supposed to convey, which is what all these groups do. John 6, verses 53 to 56, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath everlasting life. I will raise him up at the last day. That's used to support the idea of the literal body and blood of Christ in the Catholic Mass, the wafer and the wine. Those verses completely rested from their context mean nothing of the kind. John 6, 53, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and the Catholic apologist will say, see, we take the Bible literally, and you fundamentalists, you don't. But you're taking that literal verse out of its context. Verse 35, in the very same chapter, Christ said, he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. The way you eat and drink his flesh and blood is by coming to him and believing. It's a spiritual transaction that takes place between you and God. That's one way to disprove their theory. Verse 57, which they never quote, Jesus said, As the living, as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth my flesh shall live by me. Now, does anyone think that the way Christ had fellowship with the Heavenly Father was by eating his flesh and blood? Obviously not. No Catholic would go that far with it. So there's two ways to debunk that heresy. And then later on, Jesus said, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. So even if that truly was the real flesh of Jesus in their wafer, it wouldn't do you any good. Jesus said the spirit is the spirit that's life. The words that I speak, you know, they are spirit and they are life. The flesh profits nothing. And as I've illustrated many times, over in Lanciano, Italy, there's a church that claims to have wafers and the remnants of wine that were changed by the priests several centuries ago, and they've been kept in this crystal monstrance or container. So, and they claim that it has been identified as real flesh and real human blood in that container and uh, to prove that their doctrine is true. And I guess the Catholic faith will go there and look at it and think that they're getting some sort of spiritual blessing or confirmation of their faith by staring at that stuff. If it was real human flesh in that container, if it was real human blood, or whatever is left of that coagulated blood, if it was, albeit the, the flesh of the Lord Jesus, even if it was human flesh, who wants to stick that in your mouth? <laughs> No sane person would. Maybe an insane person what, what might try it. But who wants to put that in your mouth? All right. And keeping it in a container isn't going to bless anybody. Christ said, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man. Right? So just looking at it won't benefit anyone. But people, and there are a number of other verses that could be used, singled out, to prove a false doctrine, to establish false doctrine. The Mormon religion, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29, uh, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if so be that the dead rise not? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And I'm going to 
let me get off the main highway. I'm going to go down a cul-de-sac. I'll turn around in a minute. We'll get back on the main road. The, the word for, the three-letter word, F-O-R, can go in two directions. I've taught this before, but it bears repeating. And the way to illustrate it is like this. When you go to a nice sit-down restaurant, you pay for the meal before you get it. You go to a fast food restaurant, you pay for it bef uh, before they give it to you. You see the difference? The word for can go in two directions. In Acts 2.38, when Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins, there, everyone who misinterprets it thinks, in order to get future remission uh, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost, uh, they think this is in anticipation of something God's going to give me if I get baptized first. The context should be in light of past remissions. You're paying getting baptized in the name of Jesus Christ because of past remissions over the nation of Israel through the priests and so forth. And in the, and in the uh, Mormon context, they say uh, to be baptized for the dead is because dead people before they died didn't, have, didn't hear about Joseph Smith. The context should be in anticipation of future resurrection from the dead. You're, you're looking forward to the future resurrection of the dead, and so to illustrate that, you get baptized and come back up. Uh, the, the old man is, is seen as being buried, and the new man comes to life. You're illustrating the salvation that takes place by water baptism in anticipation of future glory. But the Mormons think it, the context, uh, the meaning should go backwards, and the Charismatics think in Acts 2.38 the meaning is, is forward-looking. They both have it back, they both have it wrong. They both went the wrong direction with the word for. But the approach of rightly dividing the word of truth and being able to read English is so vital to a believer. It's necessary. Do you realize how many people, now I say this not as some sort of expert in English. I was not a good student in school. I'm trying to improve, trying to get better. But it's amazing to me how, how many millions Hundreds of millions of people throughout the world want to learn English as a second language, particularly American English, because of America's reputation throughout the world as a leader in every area. And it's surprising how poor Americans' own English skills are. They don't punctuate, they don't use proper grammar, they don't use capitals. They leave off things. They don't, leave, they don't include articles. The words a or the word the, the definite and indefinite articles aren't even included. It's not the purpose church in Pomona. It's purpose church. There's no a purpose, the purpose, church with a purpose. Not there. This charismatic group up the, church, up the street, theirs is called truth church. It's not a, a truth, the truth. It's simply truth. No articles anymore. And, and they're... So people's communication skills are becoming worse and worse all the time. I'm always impressed by how keen most Korean people's understanding of their own language is. I'm learning little by little. If I try to send a text to somebody in Korean, and I miss one letter, I, they'll send back, they'll shoot back the correct spelling. No politeness, no, you know, grace, no kindness to me. No, just send it back, exclamation point, you know, you did it wrong. Thank you for correcting me. But can you do it a little more softly next time? Yeah, I'm a snowflake. I need a safe space. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Charismatics have based so much of their heresy on that text. What they really mean is, if Christ healed then, he will heal today and do the same things today through 
the work of our ministries and through the work of our healing evangelists and so forth. That's what they mean. That's what they're trying to angle at. He was a baby yesterday. He's not a baby today, right? He had black hair, according to Song of Solomon, chapter 5 and verse 11. Read the color of his hair, Revelation chapter 1, verse 14. He preached only to the nation of Israel yesterday, Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6. Not so today, Romans chapter 10, verses 11 through 13. He raised the dead to life yesterday. Can Benny Hinn do that today? He walked on water. No TV preacher can do that. He produced his tax money out of the mouth of a fish. I'd like to see Jesse Duplantis pull that one off, right? And the list could go on. He healed uh, some guy's blind eyes with mud and spit. Did Oral Roberts heal blindness that way? He never healed anyone with blindness. And like I said earlier, it's amazing how one guy will be exposed as a trickster, a huckster, charlatan, a phony, a fraud, two-bit faker, a cheat, a liar, and someone else will come along and uh, want to copy that act. Robert Tilton. How many have seen Robert Tilton on YouTube for another meme? Okay, another reason. I won't go into that one, but... VHS tape. Hmm? I saw it on VHS tape. Yeah. And, and uh, it's amazing how one guy will come along and try to replace the guy that just got exposed. The verse has to be explained here in its context. Christ is constant in his love and his promises to the saints. Look at verses um, 15 and 16. No, not verses and then five and six. I'm sorry. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And in that context, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The idea that because he healed men, healed lepers, that you can heal lepers today, uh, calling on his name, is a lot of uh, stuff they clean up in the barnyard. Verse 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Diverse and strange doctrines. That could be those just like the ones we mentioned a moment ago, charismatics, uh, or those proffered by the Roman Catholic Church, the bread and the wine, the priest's power to forgive sins, uh, the Virgin Mary appearing on some Mexican shower curtain. Um, it, it, the list goes on all the time. Um, Mary's always appearing in the coffee stain on someone's countertop. She's always appearing in a not whole arrangement on a wood paneling. Why is, you never hear of Moses appearing on some Jew's pastrami sandwich, right? It's always the Virgin Mary. And it's a feed into the sad ignorance of people who have been uh, raised to believe that this is the way God deals with the world through odd miracles that only the church can interpret for you. Um, let's see. It could also refer to diverse and strange. It could also refer to some of the meaty subjects that you and I learn and discern as Bible believers. Some things that deal with dispensational revelation. A baby Christian is not ready to handle that. You let a new Christian begin to read their Bible and enjoy what they're reading and get a blessing from what they're reading. And the questions will come to them along the way. And when those things do, then a more uh, seasoned Christian or someone who's read their Bible more often can help 
find the right answer, right? To find the right um, understanding and explanation for that verse which gives them some trouble. As we say often, it's the job of a Christian to compare Scripture with Scripture and then let the Scriptures interpret themselves in time. But, um, for example, you wouldn't tell a baby Christian that you might not be able to teach a, a brand new Christian the subject of grapes being the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. They might not grasp a hold of that right away. Um, the idea that prior to that, Adam and Eve probably had nothing more than water in their circulatory system. And the blood came from them eating the forbidden fruit, and that fruit being more than likely a grapevine. In the book of Ezekiel, a grapevine is called a vine tree. So in that sense, the, the vine can be included among the trees. And it's the only, by the way, to eat the vine, to be, eat any fruit of the vine, is the only fruit in the Bible that was forbidden for any reason under the, the uh, vows of a Nazarite in the book of Numbers. So you put all those verses together, but a, a young Christian's not ready to handle all because he's still getting acquainted with the Bible, the books of the Bible. You know what a young Christian needs to do? He needs to commit all the books of the Bible to memory. That's one of the something every new Christian ought to do. Learn all the books of the Bible by memory and be able to recite them in order because that way you know where to search your Bible when someone cites a verse or recites a calls for the book of the Bible, you know where to look. That helps. And then begin committing key verses to memory as a great comfort. And uh, Brother Ron was telling me he's doing that already, and thank the Lord for that. God bless you. And um, before you start teaching them what we call the deep things of the Word of God, and uh, some things are milk and some things are strong meat. Look back at chapter 5, Hebrews 5. Notice there, verse 12. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Notice, not with meats, mentioned right in the text of verse 9 today. Let me read the whole verse again before we conclude. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. There are some people who are so obsessed with what we might call deeper, meaty subjects. And those subjects are fascinating to the mind. They're fascinating to someone's sense of knowledge about the revelation of God's book. But they may have absolutely nothing to do with your daily walk with Christ in grace. They may be completely unrelated to whether that's going to succeed or not. When I go to work every day, I don't pray, God, give me a chance to talk to uh, my boss about whether uh, angels have wings on their back. No, I don't do that. Help me to be a good testimony. Help me to do my job honestly and successfully as he directs and so forth. To have favor with the guy that I work for who's signing my paychecks. That's what a Christian needs to be concerned with. I'm occupied with grace, not with those things that are weighty and difficult at times. And you might even interpret that uh, literally as meats, like Romans 14, verse 17. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, satisfying the body and the flesh, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So uh, those physical things, some people want to know all the details and have you know exactly how many hairs are going to stand up on the back of the neck of the Antichrist when he faces the Lord Jesus Christ in judgment one day. You know, they want to know everything which uh, may or may not have any relevance to their daily walk, and yet they know nothing about grace and kindness and mercy and the love of God. I said last week, I believe God wants to save sinners. I believe he wants to make it as easy 
for a sinner to call out to God and cry out to God for salvation as he possibly can. How much theology did you understand before you could get saved? If you knew you were a sinner in need of God's help, that's enough. If you knew you were on your way to hell, you didn't want to go there, that's plenty of good motive to get saved. That's all someone knows, and he knows what he's been doing is going to take him straight to the devil's hell. He cries out to God in desperation. God will save him. I believe that. Because God sees the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. That's some doofus comment to my uh, Sunday school lesson last week. That you mean God will save somebody without any knowledge of repentance, the doctrine of repentance? God will save? Yes, he will. That guy's already desperate. He already knows he's been making a mess of it. He doesn't want to do it anymore. And he needs some help. And uh, somebody lingering on the sidewalk who just got hit by a bus, you're waiting for the ambulance to arrive, he's in and out of consciousness. You can't teach him the deep, meaty things of doctrines in the New Testament. You tell him, call upon God for salvation. God will see their heart. God will save them if they mean it. God knows whether they mean it or not. It's not your job. But if they are, truly want God and only what God can do for them, yeah, I believe God will meet them at that place. You know, I um, talked to one of our missionaries, uh, whose name I'm not going to give. He's in a communist country. And uh, where he's at, he doesn't have a chance to invite people to come to his church. Maybe six months later, they'll be in the mood to leave the house and go to his meeting. And then little by little, he deals with them and teaches them the Bible and prays that the Holy Spirit bring conviction and they begin to understand the things of salvation and their need for, for, for a savior and someone to forgive them. But uh, he lives in a building where there's a common shower that all the residents uh, use, kind of like a you know, dormitory shower. And he says when he's taking a shower, that's when he has to talk to somebody, some other guy taking a shower next to him. He has to get right to the point and trust God to do the rest. See, if you're not giving God enough credit that he knows what he's doing when he moves upon someone with conviction and convincing that they're a sinner, they need what only, what only God can do for them, then uh, you're, you're missing out. You're missing out. You're not seeing the forest for the trees uh, or vice versa, however that expression goes.